everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Nicole Lamberson. I was trained as a physician assistant and I currently volunteer doing outreach for the film, Medicating Normal and hosting conversations like the one we're gonna have today. Our guest today is Dr. Yosef Witt Daring. Dr. Witt Daring is a board certified psychiatrist who runs a private practice that specializes in helping patients safely discontinue psychiatric medications. Dr. Witt Daring's interest in psychiatric drug withdrawal developed after he began researching the clinical experience of protracted withdrawal on the online withdrawal communities. He completed a psychiatry res residency at Baylor College of Medicine and a fellowship in psychiatric drug development at Janssen Research and Development. Dr. Witt Daring has also worked as a medical officer at the FDA's Division of Psychiatry Products his broad experience in clinical, pharmaceutical, and regulatory settings gives him a comprehensive understanding of risks and benefits of psychiatric medications. So welcome, Dr. Witt Daring. Thank you for being here with us today. Great. Thanks. Thanks for having me here, Nicole. Yeah, sure. Did yeah. I leave anything out of your introduction or anything you want to say just to sort of... Um, sure. Yeah, no, I, there's definitely things I have to say. I've been... Um, you know, the, uh, the opinions today, they're mine. They're not um, opinions from the FDA or any other places that I've worked at in the past or that I'm working at currently. Uh, yeah, so everything that you hear from me is my my opinion or my take on, on, um, on these issues. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So I guess just to get started, um, you did your residency in psychiatry, I believe. Mm -hmm. And Yes. Okay, when did you complete your residency? Uh, 2015. Okay, so fairly recently. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, what is the recent teachings to residents that you saw when you were one about, you know, adverse effects from psychiatric medications and withdrawal from psychiatric medications? Were mm -hmm. you taught much about them at all in school? Sure, actually, and let me just say, it's actually 2019. I started in 2015. So okay. 2019 is what, uh, when I finished. And yeah, so uh, re uh, very recently. Um, and um, specifically, you know, the curriculum does not focus so much on uh, adverse drug reactions. I mean, there are some of them that are fairly well known. You know, we, we learn a lot about tardive dyskinesia from antipsychotic medications, maybe akathisia on SSRIs. But um, Typically, what we learn about benzodiazepine withdrawal is really the acute stuff that happens to everyone, and this is like seizures in the emergency room. Um, I would say uh, most physicians, uh, psychiatrists as well, are going to be aware of physical dependence that develops after prolonged use, um, but not specifically the issue of, I guess, benzo injuries, protracted withdrawal, neurological symptoms, um, you know, following drug discontinuation or the ones that emerge while you're on it. That is, um, you know, not well known, I guess, even among uh, psychiatrists that have gone through residency. So it's hardly touched on. It, it wasn't touched on at all. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was e e my experience, too, even though I didn't do a psychiatry residency, just being in PA school, we didn't have any training whatsoever on uh, withdrawal syndromes or adverse effects. So mm -hmm. um, what about like the chemical imbalance? theory was that yeah i mean that was um for me not so much i mean that 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 sounds like medical school for me i know a lot of colleagues that kind of learned uh you know they they were taught with a lot of that language about uh you know that overly emphasized the biological components of depression and anxiety um i felt at least at my training that you know it was uh taught to me as you know this is one of many tools to help you know, with people that have depression, anxiety, and these problems. So uh, the chemical imbalance, uh, you know, that I guess Robert Whitaker writes a lot about was, um, uh, I, I guess, maybe thankfully, you know, not something that was really taught so much at my residency with, with that same emphasis. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, so speaking of Robert Whitaker's book, Anatomy yeah. of an Epidemic, I believe, um, that that was sort of like the catalyst for you um, 
you know, mm -hmm. starting to be maybe like a questioning student. And I also heard a rumor, and you can tell me if this is true or not, but that <laughs> you sort of read the book and you were in medical school and started questioning and you were kind of ostracized a little bit for doing so. Is that true or no? Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. let me do one and then the other. Um, okay. So I guess first I, I would say that's definitely the case that it got me interested in this. You know, I, it wasn't even recommended by someone. I think I was just on Amazon and, uh, you know, I was kind of reading, reading books and I said, that looks interesting. And um, I guess the main thing that really, uh, the two main ideas that the book um, planted in me was, we don't really know whether these things are beneficial long-term, you know, because that, that, that's a big theme in there, you know, what's the, the research like on, you know, long-term use for this. And, and it's, and you know, and it's, it's spotty, you know, some of it, um, especially the randomized withdrawal studies, you know, in the clinical trials where they pull people off, you, you know, you can't really differentiate between relapse and withdrawal symptoms. So there was, again, that was that one question that, you know, it may not be a good idea to have people take these medications indefinitely. And that's not really emphasized so much in uh, psychiatric training, you know, once people are on, if it's, you know, working, you know, they usually stay on or they accumulate medication. So that was the one idea. The other one um, was that uh, a lot of people have side effects, you know, that aren't recognized well and, and which get um, uh, pushed off onto the underlying illness. And for me, it really, I was reading it, I think, at a time where I was doing a lot of emergency room psychiatry and consult liaison type psychiatry. And there are a lot of people coming in with symptoms that didn't quite fit. This is just a, you know, relapse of your bipolar disorder. You know, this might be agitation because we just started you on a Bilify or something like that. And so I kept on having these experiences where um, I was more successful because I was thinking, you know, maybe this is due to the drug or maybe this is, you know, uh, an adverse reaction and, and it was successful. And, um, and that kind of, so yeah, the book definitely started get um, put me on that track. And then, you know, I met a lot of, uh, you know, I read a lot of other things and I met with other folks. I think David Healy is probably, you know, a big influence on me. I, I like a lot of his work and yeah, but it all started with Robert Whitaker. Um, and then, um, um, you know, as for, uh, you know, getting in trouble during residency. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I definitely, recall uh you know unwelcome glances and things like that and you know maybe not performing as highly as others but you know uh to be fair some of that may have been due to my approach as well you know i think i've softened a lot as a questioner uh, over over time but uh you know with these things i think it you know really depends on how you kind of question and ask so you know <laughs> i did yeah have uh, have a couple run-ins you know of with attendings that may not have been uh, so happy with my assessments or maybe me di disagreeing more so with their assessments. Yeah. yeah. It is hard yeah. sometimes to mm -hmm. like present it right or not to be, you know, defensive mm -hmm. or angry or, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I understand that for sure. So I think I've lost you. I was one of the people who. I think our internet is slightly. Oh, are you back? I think we I'm dropped. back now. Yeah, ho hopefully we'll just edit it out later on. But okay. uh, you disappeared for about probably 20 seconds or so. But I, okay. I'm hearing me the audio again? now. Could yes, you please. Hear me? Okay, sorry, yeah. everybody. Um, so I was just saying in class, you know, when you were questioning or you know with these um, in your residency, did anybody else like agree with you? And and also, um, what do you think? about yourself made you be able to think critically 
um, I always want to know of people who are the critical thinkers, why you think you even bought Bob's book to begin with, because I, you know, I, mm -hmm. I went to PA school and I admit that I was not questioning or critical at all. I just sort of like took the information and regurgitated it and believed it. So what do you think? Uh, I, I'd probably say, you know, my nature is, a, is maybe a little contrarian, you know, I, I tend to be that way, maybe not, you know, not just in my career, but in my personal life as well, you know, kind of outspoken. So, you know, things that go against the grain are kind of appealing to me, you know, I tend, you know, I, uh, you know, like spirited discussions and things like that. So that, uh, yeah, that, that may be part of it. And, um, Time, time, bandwidth for it. You know, while I was over at the U.S. training, I didn't have a, a lot else going on. You know, I moved there. I didn't have a lot of friends and family, and I was always like a very, uh, I guess, avid reader. So I would, that was kind of how I approached things. I would try and just grab every single book I could, and some of it stuck. And, you know, like I said, with Robert Whitaker and David Healy, you know, you know, after I was interested from Robert Whitaker's book, I would read some of David Healy's stuff and say you know, this person is writing things that, you know, I really um, haven't thought about, or he's characterizing things in an interesting way. And so I would kind of collect things along the way, you know, different authors who I thought, you know, Joanna Moncrieff is like another one who has some really, um, you know, great ways of um, um, uh, characterizing the use of psychiatric drugs for treatment. So um, as for my colleagues, um, you know, I don't know. It, it's not something I've given a lot of thought to, you know, why, you know, why me and not them? You know, sometimes I think, you know, I, were, I was with a lot of people who had, you know, young families and things like that. Sometimes there's just other things going on, you know, while you're going through training or, you know, it's hard for me to comment on, on, on why me and not the others. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> but there were others, you know, I had some good friends who I spoke to, you know, who were open to it and would listen and, you know, we could have good discussions about it, but I was probably... You know, that was my main interest. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, in 2018, you wrote a pretty popular piece called mm -hmm. Online Communities for Drug Withdrawal. What can we learn? Um, first, thank you for writing that because I share it with people all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, you know, a couple years ago. And now you're um, seeing patients in your own practice. And I'm wondering... Um, Aside from being in the online communities, or, or if you're still in the online communities, um, but also from your own patients, what what have you learned sort of since then from them? Um, that that's a good question. So, you know, the real um, what have I learned from my patients? I would say that. It is it is uh, it is a hard thing to recover from, you know these the, the benzodiazepine injuries. I feel like I would serve both as a, a someone who does the recommendations for the medications, but also as a um, kind of a support and a motivator. You, you know the um, uh, you know there's there's a lot of pain with benzodiazepine withdrawal, and once you have the the, the chemical injury, but for me, the challenging thing can sometimes be the depression that goes along with it, especially in the waves. You know, I, I have a lot of patients and, you know, we'll be doing well and then they'll get a wave of pain, but it's just this overwhelming depression that everything becomes negative. And even though we've kind of talked about the process of coming off, you know, it's really supporting them quite a lot through the wave um, because their brain almost gets hijacked by the, it's like the, a chemical depression you know, this is not going to work. I'm going to be like this forever. You know, I'll never get through this. Um, and then, you know, it ends. And so the, the more work I've done with these patients is um, I feel more uh, hopeful, you know, for, for a lot of them, you know, when I work with them and see them over time, get better, you know, my general experience has been that as you go down on the dose, people actually tend to look better, come back to life more um but it, it's it's a really challenging thing to treat um and um you know i've tried so many different things um you know over, over the years now 
the pain can be really hard. You know, I have some patients that I most feel like they're getting electrocuted. You know, first thing in the morning, they feel these shocks that jolt them. And, you know, we've tried everything from, you know, different gabapentins, uh, you know, gabapentin, Lyrica, even to opiate pain medications, things like Suboxone and even ketamine. So we, we really try um, and do whatever we can to help people cope with the symptoms um, as, as they come down. Um, but it's, it, it's challenging. Yeah. It, it's a really hard population to, um, uh, uh, to, uh, to work with, but uh, it's a very fulfilling one. Yeah. Okay. So um, sort of yeah. something you said here in this answer kind of goes in the next question. So I'll, I'll bring it up again, but um, I think you said somewhere that like 75% of your practice is helping people get off psych meds. Is that about right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. So an and the majority of those are, are, are benzos. Um, okay. You know, we do some antipsychotic papers and some antidepressant ones, but uh, uh, I guess because of my involvement with Vic, you know, we see um, mostly benzo cases. Okay. And so this is, and I just want to say, you know, this is myself and my wife, you know, she's, almost doing more of this now that, than I am, you know, I'm, I'm involved in a few other projects, but she's heavily um, interested in this work and, you know, seeing, seeing a lot of patients now. Yeah. Okay. Marissa is her name. Marissa. Right? Yeah. We'll have to get her on next time. I, I think okay. she'd have a lot of clinical insights on it, but yeah, yeah, she, we work together on that. Okay, great. So mm -hmm. with the psychiatric drug patients, mostly benzodiazepine patients, what kind of an approach um, do you take with withdrawal? Uh, when somebody comes in, they're on a benzo, they're physically dependent, mm -hmm. they want to come off. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really flexible. Um, I guess another thing that I learned uh, going into this was the, the Aston manual, like the transition to Valium, like it works great for some people, but for some folks, it just doesn't, you know, it, it seems to make them kind of depressed or flares up the symptoms in some way. So that's, we used to put everyone on Valium uh, and, and now, so we're a little bit more cautious. I mean, we may say, you know, we can try it, um, but there's a risk that it won't work out. You know, how about we try and just keep you on what you're on and come down gradually. Um, my wife sometimes just uses almost like two at once, you know, she'll use Valium as a nighttime um, dose. She'll replace the, the evening dose of the medication with Valium. And she's had some success with that, um, not fully transitioning folks. Um, but I would say that the general um, way we approach it is, is, is flexible. If I were to say what I would usually do is if it, if they're not having a lot of inner dose withdrawal type symptoms, I may just recommend that we keep them on the medication that they're on mm -hmm. and do dry cuts because it's, it's the simplest. Um, if they're starting to have a lot of concerns about um, uh, precision, you know, we go to, uh, do compounding pharmacies with powder and then after that, if they feel like they would like to do uh, liquids, um, we sometimes do that as well. But I'm sometimes, you know, I don't, I, I still haven't quite made my mind up about um, whether the liquid, you know, the the advantage of liquid over just small small amounts compounded, you know, in, in into tablets. So, um, but yeah, that, that's that's kind of the approach. And the whole while while we're doing this is, um, you know, if 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 someone is having, I guess, devastating pain that's preventing them from, you know, playing with their children, you know, going out, you know, doing anything around the house, then we will also use um, medications for, for pain. Um, yeah, so that's my next question, I, I guess, is um, in the 75%, you said you also help manage adverse effects. So... Um, <laughs> I just know, having been in the in the withdrawal support groups for 12 years now, I know that whenever there's mention of other medications like gabapentin, mm -hmm. Erica, opioids, you know, those kinds, of, everybody gets like, oh my mm -hmm. God, more drugs, you know, um, mm -hmm. and part of it's for good reason because I've seen firsthand that for some reason, and I don't know if it, I mean, I, you probably read in Ashton, I think it's in her what does she call the thing that she wrote like later? Um, it's like the addendum. I don't know. Paper. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but mm -hmm. she says for something like for reasons un unknown, 
people seem to have these reactions to things mm-hmm. when they're in benzo withdrawal medications they tolerated before they don't tolerate anymore um and so everyone is sort of scared that mm-hmm. when you I- introduce new agents either the person is going to become physically dependent on the new thing like gabapentin and then have to go through withdrawal again or they're going to have like an adverse drug reaction um, because their nervous system is destabilized from Mm -hmm. benzoyl. So have you had success with some of the adjunctive medications? Have you had people having bad reactions? How's it going? Sure, yeah. Um, It's a mixed bag, yeah. I would say uh, caution going into it is definitely advised. Usually the folks that end up on these other medications they've been so burnt by their doctors and medications in the past. I mean, the the last thing they really want to do is to start an opioid medication or something like a gabapentin for all the reasons you just mentioned. Um, It just, um, and I'm sure this may be relatable for a lot of folks, you know, listening in or, um, or, you know, if you know them, it, it is such a devastating condition that it brings people to their knees, you know, and it's to the point where they'll say, you know, this life is not really worth living at the moment. And so for those folks that are really on the severe end of it, I'm, I'm quite happy to try things. Have I made some patients um, uh, have, have some bad reactions to them? Sure. You know, they will try with, um, I'm, I, I struggle to remember, but yeah, you, you know, may give them headaches or palpitations or like the, you know, like you said, your nervous system is is kind of fried once you've had this injury. I don't know why, but it responds atypically. So some folks will feel more revved up or more anxious for a couple of days afterwards. And then we'll say, okay, that was a bad idea. Um, let's not try the propranolol anymore. Um, but I have had some um, some success with opiates, especially for that electric pain type sensation that uh, you know, to to do something very small first thing in the morning, right at that time when they get it, and it improves the quality of life, and, and you know, it helps them proceed with their taper. I mean, they're not stalling out, but it will be a problem later on. You know, eventually they will need to come off that medication, but it's a, uh, I guess a, um, you know, we 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 wouldn't have done it unless uh, we we thought we you know it was really necessary. So it's tricky. You know, that's the only way I could say it. It's a really challenging decision for the patient and for me to make. Yeah. But we don't jump into it. What I have had success with lately um, and what my wife is having success with lately is uh, ketamine, which is really interesting, um, um, not just for the physical symptoms, but for the um, for the depression as well. Um, I think she's, you know, the last four out of five patients my wife has, has sent there to um, do um, ketamine infusions have reported improved mood and also uh, decrease in the physical symptoms. I'm not sure what to make of that. This is anecdotal, but probably out of all of the things we've tried, you know, uh, the ketamine treatments have probably been, you know, the most helpful um, in terms of a dramatic response. And this is like a um, a three times a week schedule, you know, just like for for depression um, where you do it, I think like Monday, Tuesday, Friday um, uh, with, with therapy as well. And so, it's like the ketamine assisted therapy. Uh, I think the company is mind bloom who she's been referring folks to just because they send it to the the house and you can do it with a virtual therapist. Um, How much of that is related to the support from a therapist versus the actual drug effect. It's it's kind of unknown, Um, but there is a hypothetical mechanism there. I mean, ketamine being a a glutamergic modulator is kind of the counter acting uh, neurotransmitter for uh, GABA. So there is some, I, I, I suppose, hypothetical, uh, well, a biologically plausible way that maybe it would help with a, a benzodiazepine injury. But yeah, that, that's something that we're just kind of tracking and, and, and seeing, but that, that may be helpful. Yeah. yeah. And just yeah. curious, is there a risk? I mean, if it's every, you know, three days a week or something, is mm-hmm. it a super low dose? Is there like risk for physical dependence to ketamine or not really? Um, I think the risk for physical dependence, um, is not, you know, it's, it's not a huge, uh, not a huge thing with ketamine, unless you're using it kind of daily. I'd say the main risks for ketamine are, um, a cardiovascular. It causes uh, a spike in your blood pressure. A lot of people will even go into places for monitoring, 
you know, if you've had a uh, psychotic episodes in the past, or, you know, sometimes it can cause some agitation or some psychosis. Um, it is, yeah, I suppose like all things that there, there is some risk there, but, um, yeah, I don't, I, I feel like, especially when you, you know, you're getting it through a provider and it's highly regulated, uh, either you're going to an infusion center or something like that, or getting it in the mail from a, a, a um, someone at mind bloom. Uh, it's, it's harder for you to kind of get carried away with it. You know, I know some, some doctors will compound it into nasal, nasal sprays and they'll give it to their patients. Um, you know, situations like that where you're self-administering at home are more likely to lead to, uh, you know, the kind of abuse and dependence situation. So I wouldn't say, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a, yeah, a hugely, um, uh, a huge risk I'm concerned about. Okay. Mm. Um, so you're, you're dealing with a lot of protracted benzodiazepine withdrawal in, in your practice as well. I'm just wondering like how, Mostly. Long, yeah, yeah, how long are yeah. people, um, you know, on average, you know, in withdrawal that you see, or, you know, protracted withdrawal once they come off and, um, you know, are you seeing people <laughs> heal even though they're protracted for you know months and years after yeah yeah so we started in i guess 20 end of 2019 2020 so this is it's about two years so i don't, I don't have the longest time frame you know some of these questions that oh are you, are you still still able to hear me can you hear me yep oh. i got you i'll keep on going then um uh so Keep in mind, it's 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 a two-year snapshot. Uh, overall, yeah, mo most people get better over time, is what we see. And um, when I talk to some of the mo the more active coaches in the community, you know, Jen Lee, Chris Page, you know, we we speak to them, and they've been helping folks for ten years, and you know, and they and they all share the same kind of um, 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 impression because I've asked them about this, you know, this exact question, and from the coaching that they do. Yeah. People get better over time. You know, the, the brain has a tremendous capacity to heal. And as long as you keep on going and you, and you, you don't rush things too much and you make these small um, cuts, uh, people tend to improve, you know, will you be the same as you were before the injury? Um, I'm not sure, but I, but it gets a, it gets a lot better as, as people come down on the medications and as more time goes by. Yeah. I think, um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with Baylissa Frederick either. She's a, mm -hmm. a coach who's been around forever and she says the same thing too. She fully believes that everybody mm -hmm. recovers. So yeah, you'll have to introduce me. I'm, I'm always, um, uh, you know, really eager to meet the coaches because I like to refer, the, refer people to them. Um, yeah. so sure. yeah, be happy to, mm -hmm. um, Okay, so talking about protracted withdrawal, then there's this movement um, that's going on within, you know, the activists who are in the space trying to bring attention to this problem, and they want to essentially uh, give a term or something for protracted because they don't like that protracted withdrawal seems to not really be recognized that well in medicine. And the word withdrawal sort of feels out of place. Like I've been off of benzodiazepines for over 10 years myself and I still have symptoms and I don't feel like I'm like withdrawing from anything. I'm not in withdrawal really. It <laughs> feels like the wrong word. And so there's been um, suggestions like benzodiazepine induced neurological dysfunction. Um, some doctors I've heard say that a better term would be something like neurotoxicity or toxic encephalopathy. Um, what do you think about that concept of it needs yeah. a new name? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it needs a new name. Um, and I like the first one. It was, I think benzodiazepine induced neurological dysfunction. I mean, I, um, I guess the, uh, you know, the way I, I use protracted withdrawal a lot when I talk to patients firstly, just because I think that's what everyone knows it as, but it doesn't seem, um, um, 
you know, like I guess withdrawal related after a while. It, it to me, I, I think it it just seems like you've had uh, a neurological injury. You know that has happened. You know you've sustained it, and then usually what we're treating is um, uh, the fallout from that, which can take years to months months to recover. Um, and um, um, yeah, so that that's at least the way I think about it uh, in, in probably the most concrete sense of it. The next thing I, the other thought I have was um, perhaps um, it would be good to go the route of, I guess, other uh, drug induced recognized side effects. So, you know, if you're thinking about like um, tardive dyskinesia or SSRI induced activation or akathisia, you know, these things are actually in, in the DSM. And then the question is, you know, what allowed them to be in there? You know, so somewhere along the lines, there was a coalition of physicians, you know, who went through, I suppose, the scientific process to conduct surveys, gather information on the time course and the similarities between patients to make an, ident I guess, an identifiable clinical syndrome. And then that was voted on. And then it went into you know, the purple book. So I um, I wonder if consultation with an expert in psychiatric nosology or naming of um, syndromes may be a, a useful enterprise because then you would know, okay, so how do we get doctors to recognize this syndrome? Okay, so we need to turn it into something real. What do we do? How do you break this in to tiny steps? And, you know, someone that works within that space would say, Typically, these are the kinds of studies that need to be done to validate something is real. Um, and uh, that may um, um, get, you know, more footing. Because, I mean, there's already some footing with, you know, the FDA, FDA did analyses, I think, in 2020 or the end of 2019, where they start putting, they, they put that warning in the label about the risk of protracted uh, syndrome uh, symptoms following discontinuation. So there is starting to be some traction in the scientific community there's things to reference so um that that would seems like a uh, you know a, a good next step you know to start you know what what do we need to get someone at these mainstream academic institutions to to get on board with this yeah okay mm. um so I saw your name in another article recently by The Nation called mm -hmm. Bre Breaking Off My Chemical Romance. It was a great yeah. article. And that was more about um, SSRIs, SNRIs, you know, the things we call antidepressants. Um, mm -hmm. And you said in that piece, basically, that you find it really difficult to prescribe them. And it's a really serious decision for you. Um, I guess... Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that thought a little bit? Why, why is it difficult and why do you take sure. it so seriously? Yeah, I guess as a drug safety researcher, and that, and that is kind of my day-to-day -day job at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're in the side effects. So, um, and you're reading a lot of cases. So when it comes to the SSRIs, the things that I get the most worried about is, is like the, the sexual dysfunction that doesn't improve when people stop. I mean, that is... Um, easy to imagine how that could really um, impact you uh, in, in, in multiple ways. So that is a huge problem. Um, well, I think it's, I think it's relatively rare, but you know, when the drugs are used so commonly um, it, uh, it, it happens enough that it's, you know, people should pay attention and, and care about it. And then, so the other issue is um, the, um, yeah, similarly to the the protracted withdrawal, sometimes when the folks come off antidepressants, they get burning and tingling and pain that, and um, also dysphoria. They feel awful, um, and and uh, yeah, I, I also believe that it is due to perhaps some of the same, um, um, I guess, similar biological processes to the uh, benzodiazepines, where chronic exposure to the medications eventually changes something in in your receptors or some other thing going on neurologically where um, uh, your mood is now altered or maybe the drug is making you worse in some way because your um, receptors have changed or something like that. So 
when when you're aware of all of these things, um, it's it's hard to prescribe them because they're unpredictable. Same with the benzodiazepines. It's very, you know, you can't tell who is going to get these protracted problems. Um, so typically, I won't prescribe any antidepressants for folks who have mild problems or problems that, you know, when you look at the context of their life, you could say, here is something that I could point to that, you know, maybe some other intervention is is better place. You know, maybe some couples counseling or something like that, or or something else is going to change. But then if you have folks with very severe depression and, and it's not looking like there's an easily apparent um, intervention or, or something that's going to pass, then you start considering that more. And so I still do prescribe them at times, but, you know, with counseling, you know, you talk about these risks and again, you know, typically the people that decide to take them or who I work with, you know, are aware of them, but they are suffering greatly. And, um, uh, and yeah, they, they they can be very helpful for some people. I think it's important to remember that, you know, when used in an informed way, it, it it's a helpful intervention for some folks. Mm. What about like an alt alternatives to antidepressants, um, like that mm -hmm. might be safer? I mean, I know it's controversial, but um, I've seen some talk about like maybe stimulants for some people could be good antidepressants, but maybe you use them, you know, less on, you know, less frequently, not daily. And so they don't become as problematic as taking like an SSRI every day. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something that people could look into or it's not done so much? I guess, you know, it depends on the, on the drug effect. You know, if you, if you look at, so the, I guess the SSRIs and the SNRIs are at least the way I see it, they're primarily constricting, you know, they're, 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 they reduce your anxiety. They, they kind of pull in, um, you know, the, maybe the level of irritability or anxiety you have. When you look at something like Wellbutrin, it seems to give people a little bit more energy, get up and go. Metazapine is very, it can be very calming, also a little blunting, but helps people sleep. The stimulants are more for focus and attention. So yeah, I, I think, you could um, definitely, you, you could use stimulants in that way off label uh, if that helped and that may be a less um, risky uh, pharmacologic therapy to use. Um, you know, the SSRIs, they don't really work that way though. You know, that like the stimulants will work that way. Metazapine may work that way to help you sleep, but you really only get that kind of constricting um, anxiolytic effect when you take the antidepressants long-term. So there's that. I mean, obviously, outside of um, uh, drug therapies, you know, TMS as well. Some people find that helpful. Um, there's ketamine, where you, you know, you're exposed to something only once every th uh, three times a week, uh, and that can have a dramatic effect. Um, and then there's a lot of the um, you know psychotherapies and counseling and things like that. And that's where it gets like really tricky because, you know, the majority of the psychiatric population can't, uh, you know, they don't have the resources to do that all the time, or they have other things going on like family. And that's where uh, I think general psychiatry is the most challenging for me because you are almost pigeonholed into using a lot of um, medications for folks that do not have access to other uh, less harmful interventions. So um, that's yeah. kind of my download, I guess, on that topic. Well, yeah. even food, like, you know, yeah. I noticed for myself when I started mm -hmm. eating a certain way, I stopped biting my fingernails for the first time in my entire life. But like eating right is also expensive if mm -hmm. you're going to do yeah. it, you know? So there's there's all these barriers to- um, And it takes a lot of time, right? To, yeah. to prepare that nice food as well. It's a huge amount of time. Um, yeah, and to learn yeah. about all yeah. of it. I mean, it was like yeah. a- you know, another undertaking just to get in, delve into that world and learn yeah. what I was doing. So, yeah. 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 I mean, you could forget about it. I mean, if you're a two, two career household with a couple of kids, you know, just both working because you need to, yeah. it is, you know, yeah, it is really hard to find the time to, to do any counseling or look after yourself, um, you know, in terms of food and exercise. So well, and that's, as as, yeah. yeah. As far as you saying, like, it's a very hard decision for you to prescribe. One thing I hear from um, medical providers all the time, and I remember from when I was seeing patients is like, sometimes patients want things they, you know, mm -hmm. 
really want something. And so how, how do you approach that as just like a collaborative type um, relationship then if they are super invested in starting an antidepressant? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I would say pretty much. Um, I, um, you know, usually I'll, I'll, I'll say my piece about it and try and understand where the, um, um, the drive is, you know, usually it's just like, you know, well, my sister took it and, you know, she's doing really well on it or my mom took it and that's helped her a lot. Um, uh, but yeah, I try, I try and get to the bottom of, of, of where that's coming from. And, um, we may take a few sessions just to talk about, um, to do a, you know, a more detailed history, you know, sometimes it's, you know, it's like PTSD, you know, the depression is coming from dysfunctional relationships uh, due to um, maladaptive, I guess, ways of interacting with people that you've learned because you, you know, had a bad, you know, had some bad experiences in the past. And we'll take a few days to look at that, you know, kind of see the feasibility of other interventions. And if they still feel strongly about it, you know, with informed consent, I'm happy to, um, uh, oversee that, you know, and, and, and help that uh, proceed in the safest possible way. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So on informed consent, actually, um, mm -hmm. you know, I see all the time, these contradictions in, you know, um, information, like for instance, Dr. Alan Francis, I'm sure you're aware of him mm -hmm. says, uh, and he can be quoted as saying yeah. benzodiazepines are pretty much useless drugs in anyone. Like he is very much against the use of benzodiazepines. Mm -hmm. um, he says they have almost no benefits, tons of risks, but then you can look and find, um, you know, right next door to that, an article by this international task force on benzodiazepines who they formed basically to make the point that the, the risks and side effects of benzodiazepines are overemphasized. So mm -hmm. all of this conflicting information out there and you're a patient and you're trying to like know who to believe and what to trust, um, mm -hmm. you know, do you think patients can really actually receive informed consent um, in that space with all, all of the information that's conflicting and, and can they really understand how badly they can be damaged and affected by a drug just by us telling them? Probably not. You know, I, I, I don't, I, don't I, I can't imagine, you know, really describing that level of detail. Um, you know, it, it's usually pretty high level. If I were to think about my spiel on uh, on benzodiazepines it would be uh you know if you want to take this this is you know this is a uh, you know, obviously not a long-term solution to your problems you know over time you're going to habituate to the drug and it's going to become less effective and you may even go higher and higher on a dose until you get to a level where you have really bad side effects and then coming off it is going to be a nightmare for you you know insomnia or worse you could have long-term neurological, you know, problems that, that could stick around for years. I mean, something like that might be how I would describe it, but there's still a, I mean, there's still a space for them. Um, someone wants to get on an airplane, you know, yeah. take a Xanax, you know, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, just had a kid, can't sleep, falling apart. Okay. You could take, take this for, you know, three days or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so for short-term use, I think they're obvious. I mean, most people probably on the call will, you know, ha have taken them. Um, and so, yeah, they, they work. They, they work really quickly. They're very calming and sedating. But the long-term uh, is where the issue is, you know, once you start using it over a couple of months consistently. Yeah. You know, I even, I wouldn't have a problem with someone taking it, you know, once or twice a week long-term. I don't think that's enough to really cause those type of problems. Um, but yeah, it's the consistent daily use where you go higher and higher, where people get trapped. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, so I will, I will, I will say, I actually, unfortunately, I have a hard stop at four, so I just want you to know in case. Um, okay. Uh, just for timing with questions and things like sure. that at the end. Okay, yeah. I'll keep an eye. Um, mm -hmm. Your work uh, for the FDA as a medical officer, where you mm -hmm. saw, you know, how psychiatric medications are approved and 
the challenges regulators face in detecting adverse drug reactions. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little more about that? Like how, how are the drugs approved and what are the challenges? Um, gosh, that's, that, that, that's a huge topic. Uh, I'll try and s sum it down to, um, um, I guess wh what I imagine you're asking is uh, where are some of the, um, the holes in the process? I don't know if that's kind of where it is. So, yeah. um, you know, if we look at the antidepressants, a lot of it is about um, precedent. So once, you know, Prozac hits the market and gets approved, you have every single other antidepressant manufacturer saying, okay, well, you let them go through with a six week trial or something like that. And so that becomes the standard for duration. You know, we're going to look at these for six weeks and then, and then that's it, you know, um, and um, someone goes through, Oh, we want an indication for long-term treatment. Okay. Well, the first one goes through and it's one of those withdrawal studies where you take a cohort of people on the medication and then half of them are abruptly taken off of it. Um, the obvious limitation with that trial design is it make it, it, it allows for confusion between true relapse on depression or anxiety and the withdrawal um, from, from the medication in the group. So once that goes through, everything else follows that. Um, so yeah, so there's a, there's a, you know, there's the issue of precedent where you have to be fair to other companies. Um, and then, so a lot of it comes through in a very cookie cutter way and they say, well, you know, you approve that drug that way. So you have to do the same to ours and, and, yeah, the the agency kind of functions like that. Um, for un unless it's an entirely new compound, which is what we're seeing with, I guess before I left, you know, psilocybin, MDMA, you know, these types of um, psychedelic compounds, which are to be used with therapy, there is going to be a big issue at the moment with these coming through. Of you know, what is the level of evidence that the division of psychiatry wants to, you know, if they choose to pro uh, approve it or not. Um, because every other psychedelic compound used for depression or anxiety is going to end up following their path. So I don't know, you know, how stringently they're going to look at it for, you know, risks and benefits and different things that come up. But so there's that part from a drug safety perspective, you know, why is it so hard for, you know, regulators to pick up on this until I guess recently, you know, when the label changed and um, the drug safety uh, monitoring system is, I guess it's called, you know, after a drug gets on the market, safety is usually just routine, you know, and what that means is it's dependent on people calling up Pfizer or Eli Lilly and saying this happened to me or, you know, dropping a report on the FDA's website. Um, and then uh, the report has to be a quality report. And that's not always um, intuitive uh, for patients to write and also for physicians writing them on behalf of their patients. You know, it has to spell out, um, I was on the drug for this for this long. These were the symptoms. They happened in these bodily areas. I had, you know, headaches, depression, you know, GI symptoms were this and that. I had paresthesias, nerve symptoms. This is the time course. And, you know, then that also need medical history. You know, these are the other medical conditions I had. These were the other drugs that I had. So you actually, I mean, you need quality reports when you're doing these things. So someone on the other side can look at it and go, wow, there's really no alternative explanation for what happened apart from the drug. Because, I mean, the FDA will rarely follow up on individual reports and to ask more questions. They don't have the bandwidth for that. And um, uh, the pharma companies may not do that either, um, depending on the priority of the safety issue. Um, so you, um, so from the FDA side, you, you're sitting there and you would, get all of these reports coming in and they're all saying, you know, I was on a benzodiazepine for, you know, two years and now I have these symptoms. And specifically for the issue of benzodiazepine um, injuries, it's, um, it's uncommon to have an injury occur after being on a drug for so long. There's, there's not a lot of examples about that. You know, I think of the movement disorders caused by antipsychotics as, as the main one, which is widely recognized as occurring months after being on the drugs. Aside from that, there's not a lot of other ones that come in that shape and form. Typically drug side effects emerge within the first two weeks and they disappear, you know, when you stop them, these kind of injuries are really hard to pick up on. 
um, mainly because there's, you know, bet- if you start a drug and then there's two years, there's so many things that could have happened in between, you know, and the person on the other side is going to say, well, maybe this report is not fully detailed. You know, this could just be some anxiety and depression. Maybe they developed fibromyalgia. Maybe the, you know, they, uh, other medications that they're on are playing a part. So th- it makes it extremely challenging to tease out those kind of problems. Typically what you need and what happened with the benzos in 2019, 2020, um, uh, I suppose a group of researchers got together, they collated these findings and uh, presented it in a report, but that was a huge effort of manpower. So un- unless you have people that are really motivated and uh, organizing things in a way that's compelling, it's it's unlikely to, um, to affect any change uh, for complicated problems like this. So that's... Uh, I don't know if that's that that was helpful, that kind of overview from the regulatory side. But just um, quickly, it, mm-hmm. do you, you feel like the bed the med watch reports when you have been injured, it's important to fill those out if you are a doctor or a patient who was harmed? Yeah. I wish there was more guidance on what goes into a quality report. I may have to write one myself to circulate uh, among people, you know, how did what is the information you have to include for it to um, for the person on the other end to say, hang on a second, like this is this may be something I'm gonna you know start tracking these, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I know you have to go soon. I guess we'll we'll ask one more question and close, and then you can um, pop off and get back to work. Um, I guess yeah. it's May, so it's Mental Health Awareness Month. Mm-hmm. Um, which is a big month, you know, that's sort of co-opted by a lot of the chemical imbalance, you know, believers and that kind of thing. What, what kind of message would you have for, for Mental Health Awareness Month um, from where you sit and what you've seen as a psychiatrist? Um, I have to say, I'm not sure. Um, until you told me it was Mental Health Awareness uh, Month, I hadn't meditated. No, okay. I hadn't, I hadn't meditated on it too much. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess as a drug safety person, it's you know, be careful. You know, May, go, going into any in, interventions if they're pharmacologic um, or um, you know, devices, whether it's TMS or other things. Uh, um, take your time make an informed decision, you know, move forward with someone you trust. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's an important mm-hmm. message. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So if, if, um, people watching want to find you or, um, you know, become a patient of yours, where, where can they do that? Um, you can give your oh. website, are you on social media, anything like that? Yeah. So it's, um, our website is probably the best way it's with during psychiatry.com. Um, Currently, we are practicing um, in uh, Utah, and um, we are also practicing in Maryland, Pennsylvania, um, New Mexico, Texas, um, and um, practicing in Georgia, but not for benzodiazepines, uh, just for antidepressants. Um, And... um, so that's those are the states where we could see folks. All of this is on the website, but it's withduringpsychiatry.com. And um, we'll put it in the the comments on Facebook or in the description mm-hmm. on YouTube, wherever people mm-hmm. are watching. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, um, any other closing thoughts before we go? No, just. Um, um, Thanks for having me on. You know, it's a, it's an honor, and um, you know, you've interviewed some great people. So I'm, you know, I'm, uh, you know, honored to that 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 you had me on to to speak with you and everyone. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming, yeah. and thanks for all your great work at Vic, and your you did a great um, testimony at the Massachusetts Benzo Bill. We'll put that in the the comments for everybody as well too. So thanks for. Um, just being a critically thinking psychiatrist and somebody willing to help people sort of stuck in this, you know, horrible cobweb of benzodiazepine yeah. uh, physical dependence. It's awful. And it's even more awful when you don't have a doctor who 
believes you and understands. So thank you and your wife for being that yeah. those people for, for people who need you. So, okay, great. So, um, yeah. do a little closing spiel here for, feel mm -hmm. free to go if you have to run. Um, and then we're just going to close out. So okay. thank you everybody for joining thank us you. today. If you have not seen Medicating Normal yet, please check out our website at medicatingnormal.com slash watch for the many ways you can view it. We're currently on Vimeo and Amazon in US, UK, and Germany. We're on Films for Action, Films for Change, and Hoopla. We're also on PBS and the PBS app, and we're working on more platforms like Amazon Japan and Apple TV. You can also buy the film on DVD if you're in the United States and Puerto Rico. As always, check our events tab on Facebook for more upcoming interviews like this one. And thanks again so much uh, to Dr. Whit Daring for being here with us today. Um, thanks everybody for tuning in and we will see you guys soon. Bye everybody, take care.